It's Tuesday, December 7th, 2010. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, it's a round castle to stay alive. It's Rampart. Let's do this. All right, so I work. My office is not exactly in Times Square, but it's pretty close. Right? I can see Times Square from my work, you know, the, the ball with the year under it and everything. Yeah, like if I worked there and it was somebody who wasn't in the city, I'd just be like, yeah, I work in Times Square. Yeah, they, it's it's you, a tourist would consider a Times Square, and there is touristy shit up, <laughs> up to your eyeballs. God, you're the one who posted that uh, tourist's map of New York City. Yeah. You that like, was pretty great. You like that? Yeah, there's touristy shit up to your eyeballs outside my office, which yep. is why I tend to go right into the subway and get the hell out of there. See, funnily, all the touristy shit near me is kind of like, sequestered into specific areas. Like in, in Grand Central, there's that little market of ultra-expensive crap. Yeah, immediately next to my office, there's a place that you can buy all sorts of just knickknacks of, you know, Statue of Liberty magnets and gaudy postcards. See, I have the more upper class. It's like $4,000 handbag. Empire State Building statues to put on your, you know, all kinds of bullshit. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so... Most of the stuff is touristy bullshit. For example, the M&M store directly across from my office is the most bullshit in the world, right? All they sell at the M&M store, they sell M&Ms at a ridiculous price by weight. So you don't want to buy them there ever unless you need, like, a specific color mix for a special occasion. Kind of like when you need Legos. You go to that Toys R Us, and you're like, I want a 100 of this brick. Yeah, but, I mean, even then, you could probably order that online from a special, you know, holiday place. You don't need to you don't need to go to the M&M store for that and pay well, the ridiculous prices. You don't need to go to a store for anything in this modern world. Yeah, but, I mean, the M&M store is two stories tall, and 90% of the stuff that they sell is not actual candy, but, like, Stuff that looks like M and M's, Stoner's and every Pop Palace. and every single product they sell comes in a different color for each color of M and M. So it you know it's it's out of control. It's it, and everything is ridiculously overpriced. It's tourist trap number one, right? But across the street, but on the other side of the M and M store is the Hershey store. And if you look at the outside of the Hershey store, you're like, man, that is touristy shit right there. But if you go in the Hershey store, that it's a secret to everybody. Basically, the Hershey store actually sells Hershey products. Like, gasp. Gasp, right? It doesn't, I mean, they sell some Hershey merch, but not a lot. Most of the stuff they sell there is actual chocolate or candy or Well, something. well, 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 as actual as Hershey's chocolate is, which is pretty good. They also they also sell real chocolates. You Whoa. Know? And not everything in there is, is, is Hershey's, you know, milk chocolate. They have dark chocolates and, and all kinds of, every, pretty much every variety is in there, you know? Uh, except, of course, like the, the boutique stuff, like the jalapeno, whatever. They got some. Really? Yeah, they got some, you know, they got some all kinds of crazy shit in there. And the I thing like, is, I like it's a really like... small store. It's it's about the size of, like, our apartment. The outside of it looks like it's a giant store, but the inside, tiny store. M&M store is gigantic, two-story monstrosity. This is a tiny store. And you would think, all right, sure, they got all the different varieties in there, but the prices are going to be out of control, right? It's going to be like $100 for a bar, and you might as well just go to the bodega. Well, you know what? All the prices and all the stuff, it's not a discount, but it's manufacturer retail price, you know? So it, they're not ripping you off, especially if you can get a variety there that's not at the grocery store. It's worth, you know, four bo four bucks for a bag of kisses. That's, that's pretty average. I have to say, you did bring with you some uh, fancy kisses. The only <laughs> thing, I have to find out if they have some of the weird Japanese stuff that they sell in Japan but not here. Yeah, they got some stuff that, is, you know, it, it changes once in a while. You know, you look around, it's like they have something and they don't have it, right? They had yeah. dark chocolate Kit Kats, but, but, I but I didn't see them the last time I was there. But now they've got Reese's Pieces of peanut butter cups that are in the shape of Christmas trees that they didn't have before. See, that's you know. my biggest candy gripe is that I can't get the green tea and the white chocolate Kit Kats. I've seen white chocolate Kit Kats at least once. In I there. see them every now and then, and when I do, I buy them. But I don't see the green tea ones except in Seattle at PAX. I don't know. I'll have to look and see if I see the green tea ones in <laughs> if there. If you see them, the I'm Kit Kat section's pretty small. You know, the kisses and hugs are really big right now in there. Ah, uh, Kit Kat um, is really the best though. Yeah, but it's Nothing like can beat that. But yeah, so it's like the opposite of tourist trap. Give and you know what? This like Give if you go break. if you go to break the store off a piece of that Kit between Kat 10 and 11 a.m. they got they like discounts now if you go in at the right time or like bring your receipt with you you can get 10 percent off so it's like whoa this is actually like a legitimate place you might want to go so uh, I will uh, post face that by saying that we were not paid in any way by anyone to no. say that <laughs> it's just in you know it's 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 interesting to point out like if you're coming to the city you know a lot of people tourist in the city around this time it's tourist time I feel like we and should you do want, a Thursday show on the stuff to actually see in New York City. Uh, okay. But I think that's a decent show. It's okay. 
I mean, I mean tourists, not most of it is touristy. Yet. Tourists go down to Wall Street and look at the stupid bull, but they don't know about like the Highline Park. Yeah, it's like if, if you're coming to do some tourism, there are some things. If you're the kind of person like me where you'd avoid anything that would look touristy, right, then you would probably avoid the Hershey store, but it's, it should not be avoided. All right. All right. So before we get on to the, the gaming show, I just I would like to say make an open plea to the makers of Civilization V. Jesus Christ, can I not play your game until you fix this simultaneous turn bullshit? I don't think they're going to fix that, but hopefully I know, they'll but fix th- something else. But they have to fix it. I, the game... And I mean, just the lag even, you know? I mean, if you're going to have simultaneous turns, the benefit of that is that I shouldn't be waiting. But I'm waiting because it's all slow. It should be just as fast and responsive playing network gaming as it is playing local gaming. Well, what bothers me is that... Counter-Strike doesn't have this problem. Counter-Strike, which is actually... That's a real-time game. Yeah. It's a turn-based game. How come the real-time game has no lag, and yet the simple turn-based game has, like, 20-minute lag? Because the, the publishers forced them to shove the game out the door real quick without spending a whole bunch of time you know, working on re- getting it really polished, right? But that, he, and on top of that, nobody makes network code the number one priority. That's like the back burner except priority. Except Valve. Right. So. <laughs> but my specific complaint yeah, I guess World of Warcraft. is that they made the game more, quote-unquote, like a board game. Like Civ Four, you'd have big stacks of units, and the fiddliness of did this one unit attack first versus this one didn't matter that much because... I had 100 spearmen and you had 50, so I win. Economic might would just sort that out in the end, and it it worked out okay. But in this game where every individual unit's individual decisions matter greatly, much like a German-style board game, it'd be like if we're playing Puerto Rico and I just grab the captain first so I fucking get it. Yeah. It's... I love Civ Five, but I I've gotten to the point to where I cannot play it multiplayer. Even tiny little games between me and Scott, we'll have a race condition where like we both agree. All right, that was bullshit. I yeah, I mean, have won if that. you want to have simultaneous orders, right, you need to come up with a rule set to account for that. For example, the board game, the famous board game Diplomacy. Everyone hands in their orders, and then everyone and the orders resolve, and it doesn't matter who handed in the order first, as long as he handed it in on time. So they actually, the game says, okay, you had an attack order from A to B, and you had a support order from C to B, so therefore it comes out like this, right? Civ Five doesn't have that. It, it, you know, it's whoever, who's the attacker and who's the defender, they still treat the combat as if it's turn-based, but they're just sort of randomly, or whoever pushed the button first gets to be the attacker when there's... That might make a big difference, right? A lot of the units are heavily balanced towards attack or defense. You know, a spearman or a pikeman is heavily defense. But a horseman might, or an elephant is heavily offense. So if he attacks my elephant with his elephant, right, suddenly I'm in a really bad position because I didn't push the button immediately and he pushed it a second before I did. Now, this wouldn't bother me as much if... I, you know, if it was an incompetent game company making this game. No, but this has Sid Meier's name on it. He should know better. Or if Civ Five, Even like, though I know he's, you know, I don't know how much he actually works on, has his hands on the game. Some crappy indie game. Like, Minecraft, I don't necessarily complain that sometimes I get three lava buckets. Well, it's also alpha, so, you know, they, they can excuse that. Dwarf Fortress, I complain about it, but I don't complain about the fact that my dwarf is just fucking stupid. I expect him to be stupid. Like, that... <laughs> For what that game is, I expect my dwarf to be stupid. I don't expect my Civ dude to be stupid. And the reason that bothers me specifically And that is game that costs a lot of money compared to these other indie indie games. Is that it took me and Scott and pretty much everyone else we know who cares about games all of 30 seconds to come up with explicit, specific, and exact ways to mitigate this problem that w- could have been trivially implemented. I mean, why do you even have an option? Some people don't care about the simultaneous play, so whatever. Have the... Fully simultaneous mode, where it's just it's bullshit if you get close to people. Then have the you know breakout to turn based mode, where it breaks out to explicit mm-hmm. turns only when we're gonna we're gonna have to ch- we're other. gonna have to check and see if this is one of the things because Civ Five part of it is editable. There's a lot of Python scripts in there. I mean Civ Four had that. I, mean, I don't think this is editable. I'm gonna see if this is a thing that can be fixed by the user. And the the thing is, will it carry over to multiplayer? Uh, you know that we can play over. Well, Steam? considering the multiplayer game is basically a different game. Yeah. We're going to have to see if we can edit this and if we can edit it, if we, it actually works and is fixable. But I don't know. Come on, guys. Seriously. Seriously. I mean, 
I can understand when you have a problem with the game, but this, is, this isn't this is even like a bug. This is your design functionality that was just poorly thought yeah. out. I have a solution. You ready? You know my solution? Uh, we just play board games? No, no. It's Civilization VI, but you know what? We're going to change something about Civ VI. It's All not right. going to be Sid Meier's Civilization VI. Scott Rubens? It's going to be Rainer Kinesia's <laughs> Civilization VI. <laughs> that will solve all problems. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, it might be a Tower of Babel situation. Actually, a Rainer Kinesia, Sid Meier, Alpha Centauri 2. How about that? Ah. Uh, Alpha Centauri had the best weapons of mass destruction <laughs> of games like that. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so, let's see what's going on in the gaming world. Oh, I got, I got something really tiny just to mention, right? No. In, it was a long time ago, August of 2009, I pre-ordered on Amazon, right? Scott waited. Golden Sun DS. <laughs> Uh, and it it's shipping. I saw it in. Uh, I was waiting in a Best Buy just to kill time yesterday, and Golden Sun DS was on the shelf there. And Amazon shipped it to me, and it's it's in Kentucky. It's on its way, and it is currently December of 2010. So I waited a year and uh, four months. A year, Scott. When, Duke when, Nukem Forever. When was Team Fortress, Team Fortress 2, 2 announced? I know, I'm just saying. You know, this took a long time for this fucking game to come out. I saw on. a demo video of Team Fortress 2 like five years ago. But you know what? The thing was, is I pre-ordered it in August of 2009. I think Nintendo, if I recall correctly, I'm pretty sure they announced it and demoed it at like E3 of 2009. So that's like, ooh. Oh. ooh. So you want to know what's wrong with Nintendo, that sort of thing. Well, never mind. You know, where's my Advance Wars? Where, where's, where's another Advance Wars? Why don't they just take every game that they put out in Japan and put it out here? They've already made the goddamn games. Uh, uh, Mother 3. <laughs> well, uh, look at the Advance Wars situation, because the original, you know, when they released Advance Wars on the Game Boy Advance... All the other Advance Wars games. But when they released it, it was considered a big gamble, and it was very, pretty much expected to fail. They're like, Americans won't play a turn-based game. Yeah, explain to me this. Why do they bring Starfy over? But they don't bring Mother 3 or all the other Advance Wars games. I think they expected that Starfy would capture the young girl demographic and the casual gamer demographic. Oh, yeah, I'm sure Starfy but did yet, so well. Look at what they did with Advance Wars. They, you know, they, had, they had these Advance They're Wars games They're getting it right over. with Layton and Phoenix Wright. And the Advance Wars games were cute and puzzly. And then they tried to make it hardcore. Like, remember in the most recent Advance Wars? Yeah, but they released uh, Days of Ruin also in Japan, if I if I know correctly. Uh, yeah, they did. What I'm saying is that when they released that game in the U.S., when they designed the game, it was a departure from the Advance Wars series. I think it was a good departure, but they way changed the style of the game to make it dark and serious. And there was a weird trick, and I finally kind of realized why they did this. Remember how you could hit R and zoom in? which was basically the so zoomed-in view that it was stupid. Mm -hmm. You could see, like, two units. But when you zoom in, the units look all different. Notice how all the promotional stuff for that game in the U.S. only showed the zoomed-in units because the zoomed-in units look dark and hardcore and realistic, but the zoomed-out units are the cute Advance Wars icons we're used to. I think they were very specifically trying to market that game to what they expected were the hardcore sensibilities but of I Western mean, gamers. The, it, it just they're so incompetent there, right? It's like, hello, the you the reason you already re that was the fourth Advance Wars game to come out in the United States, right? So they already released three in the United States, two for the GBA and one for the DS, and all of them did well. That's why they were thinking of bringing another one. So why did they change a formula that works? This is, a, this is, I think, the number one problem, is they change a winning formula, right? Zelda 1, oh, it's a winning formula. Zelda 2, right? I mean... Ah, oh, but at the same time... I know you like Zelda 2, but I'm saying they changed a winning formula. Metroid, the time, Metroid, they Metroid... No, 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 you, Scott, you need to do both, because if you never change the existing formulas, today we'd be playing Ultra Pong Championship Edition DX 2010. That, all right, so that's true. Is and that nothing you, else. Okay, no, no, no. See, I mean, for example, that also there are some changes of formulas, right, that work out. Like, look at Mario 64, which has now gone into Mario Galaxy. Very good change of winning formula, right? Metroid Prime, a very good change of winning formula. Well, all you have to do is when you make a game like that, like, say you have a departure, if the core line is still going strong, keep making the core line. That's what I was about to say, is if you, you know, if Mario 64 is a success, right, keep it going with the 2D Marios and the 3D Marios. Don't stop the 2D Marios, right? If the oh, if the top-down Zelda's doing well and the 3D Zelda's doing well, keep them both going. Don't stop. Of right? course, Scott, you, this, your argument will fall flat. Uh, I just want to ask you one question. D is there an Advance Wars game that came out after Days of Ruin that is not in the U.S., that is in Japan? There are plenty of ones that came before. Yeah, but those... The games that come to f before often will not sell that well. It, it, there's trouble, like the Final Fantasies, until this, this like nostalgia 
trend pushed them up. If you had just released Final Fantasy 2 II and 3 in, like, 1998, they probably wouldn't have sold at all. Man. People won't go back and play a shitty old game, quote-unquote, unless there's some, like, good marketing effort behind it. Okay. Or the game has suddenly become, like, classic. So anyway, I looked on uh, on Wikipedia, right? And there are basically three uh, Advance Wars games that were not released in the U.S. Famicom Wars, Game Boy Wars, and Super Famicom Wars. Yeah, they're not that good. There's no reason to bring them out. They could make a compilation of them. I don't know put how them much... at, Put them at least on the WiiWare slash Virtual Console. See, my complaint isn't... It's not like they're making new Advance Wars games. They're not bringing them over. They're just not making Advance Wars games at all. They got to make a new one. I it, know. They're making a new Golden Sun. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they're done anyway. Because Advance Wars has captured my gaming cock more so than any other game has in recent memory. Will writes as well, apparently. Yeah. I was very happy when he said that. It vindicated the fact that to this day, I'm trying to get an S on the last three maps in DR. Yeah, I think I'm going to go all S on Pac-Man CEDX. If you're not playing Pac-Man CEDX, you suck. I got a lot of A's. I don't have any S's yet. I got a lot of S's. Of course, I haven't been playing that much. Anyway. But I do want to talk about this briefly. There was an article from actually today claiming that gamers are abandoning DS and PSP games in favor of smartphones. They have some data to back this up. Kind of. But basically, they've said that sales on the DS and the PSP have fallen 13%, and sales of games on smartphones have gone way, 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 way up, and they're predicting this huge sea change. They're predicting the PSP 2 is going to be dead on arrival, effectively, which probably. Mm. But I think what's actually going on here is, and I do believe there is a kind of trend away from the DS PSP, the traditional console, like handheld console, but I don't think it's a sea change. I think consoles like the DS has started capturing the so-called casual gamer market, and those people didn't have any options before. They're like, ooh, I want to play these silly little games, and they got a DS because it was cheap. Everyone has a smartphone now. Those people aren't even going to bother buying a DS or buying a game or anything when Cheap, crappy, like, one-off games are a dollar on their iPhone. That is true. I mean, I, I can think there's a bunch of factors, right? You already you, The one you pointed out, I definitely agree with. I definitely agree that there's a problem when I can get Choo Choo Rocket on my iPhone for a dollar, but $30 on the, on the DS. There's the fact that there's, been, de- there's also the problem There's of, been a relatively small number of compelling games on handheld consoles in the last year. That's another thing I was going to bring up, is that the, the number of games for the handheld that are like, oh, man, I got to get that. Not too many of them, right? You know, the ones I can think of right away are like there was a the adva- there was a Phoenix retro Wright. game challenge. Oh, that's way old. That's kind of old. Yeah. Right? There was the Miles Edgeworth game. There was a new Layton game and the Golden Sun DS and Dragon Quest Nine. Is a lot of people are on that. You know. Yeah, but I, how few is that? Four. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the iPhone, there's like a zillion games, so, and they're all like a dollar. We're or definitely $3. very choosy in the games we play. So let's say we expand that, triple that number, assuming there's a bunch of games we don't care about that other people care about. That's still a tiny number of releases. Yeah, that are worth playing. And I think the, the other thing is telling you from my personal experience that someone has an iPhone and a DS, right? Is my, my DS was stolen, and I was thinking, should I really replace it? You know, and the thing is, I replaced it because I got a piracy card. Yeah, <laughs> right. It wouldn't be worth it without one of those. Um, because there's a bunch of games that are sort of like I would maybe kind of want to try them out, don't really want to finish them on the DS, you know, that really aren't worth paying full price for. Notice I did pay full price for Golden Sun, which is totally, you know, that's my game. But I play games on the DS and the iPhone, and really it's changed. I used to bring the DS all the way around with me when I had a regular phone, and I'd play that all the time. But now, if I'm on, like, the subway... I'm playing like a you know some stupid games on the phone. I'm not bringing the DS with me. The DS I mostly use that for playing in bed. Like I I use the DS the same time that I would read a book. Well, or read it's a comic much like book. remember back when we had the long commutes. Like my DS was my primary console. I would come home. Oh yeah. Sit down and just play my DS for I like did a couple that hours. Back in those days, I would do the same exact thing. But nowadays. The DS is, I'm not really using it portably that much. I mean, the portability factor is basically, ah, I can play this on the couch or in bed as opposed to sitting up at now, the I desk. No, I do have a different situation. My commute is so short, I don't have any incentive to play phone games or anything. The like, thing is, my commute is so short, but even sta- just standing on the subway platform for five minutes, a game, there are games that are that small that I play. Yeah, I listen to music or I read, you know, I just do other things. All right. But what's... What's interesting here is that I think all these predictions of a sea change, what's really going on, and I, we talked about this at PAX in all of our panels, is that 
people keep saying like the market is moving toward casual games and phones and simple games and you know this whole I really think that the majority of those people are we're not gamers in the sense that there is one demographic of gamers that will always want to play so-called hardcore real games and all these people are newcomers who really like what they're playing don't compete with the other games like they're two completely separate markets yeah people might cross over between one or the other but most of this competition i think is false no one's say like really moving to the a- iphone saying I'm going to buy all my games on the iPhone now because there aren't that many good games on the iPhone. No, what it's not, you know, no one's moving to the iPhone for games. They have an iPhone and they get games, you know? It's just like what people had cell phones before, regular phones, and even on a shittiest phone you can get, you could buy Tetris on there for a couple bucks. So people go, ooh, Tetris. Do, 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 but this do, is starting to be a big problem. they're already there. And that pundits and industry analysts and game designers are looking at all these numbers and saying, yeah, there's like 20 billion people playing social games. We got to get on that shit. That's the future of gaming. Well, the reason that there's that perception, right, is if you're a game development company, you make games, you say, huh, I can make big expensive games and then try to get lucky and sell enough copies to make a profit, which potentially could be big, but probably not. Or with the same exact people at this company and the same exact talent and equipment, the resources that I have, I could devote these resources to making tiny shit games and make more money. So it's basically a diversion of resources on the developer level and the publisher level that is, you know, moving from one to the other. In all other ways, but it, there it, isn't it, it, here, a connection. Let me, let me analogize this. This would be like a guy who is a manager, or maybe he, like, owns a McDonald's, let's just say. All he right. owns a McDonald's. That's his franchise. It makes money. He's looking at it. And he sees a pita pit next door. And he's like, man, pita pit's where the money's at. I should turn my McDonald's into a pita pit because, you know, competition, whatever. Or, yeah, that car dealership makes way more money than my McDonald's. I should do that instead. Well, the difference is, right, is the, is the resources a McDonald's has, you can't just change the sign outside of McDonald's and suddenly it becomes a pita pit, right? You need completely different equipment in the kitchen, completely different new training of the employees. You know, you need to change. You need all this stuff, right? But if you have... People who know how to program games and computers, you can divert those resources to a lot of different ends without really having to do a whole lot of work other than saying, stop making the f- big fancy PS3 game, make Tetris for the P- you know, for the iPhone instead. And those same people with just all- nothing except deciding to can switch over and do something different. So if, w- if you can do that and the different thing you can do is-, is more likely to be more profitable, how can you not? So I think... The real root of all this is that in the end, the games that we care about, the so-called good games in our opinion, they're going to be made primarily by kings. And the shit games, the so-called casual social games, are going to be made by rich people. But even look at, you know, the Madden still makes a ton of money. The Call of Duty is is like the hugest story of the past year or two, making so much money. Oh yeah, but they're relatively few. And also, Portal 2 is going to rake it in. But Scott, I note that most of that industry is built on the backs of overworked, underpaid programmers who eventually are going to freak their shit out well, and look at Yeah, well, look at EA, what happened there, right, with the overworking uh, you know, situation. Look at every game company. It's well, a serious problem. I think there's also the Minecraft situation you can't ignore. That's a king. Yeah. He's a king. Good games are coming out of kings. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I got my secret project I'm working on. So anyway, things of the day. Many of you Tuesday listeners don't watch anime. That's fine. But there's a show that if you, if you find this funny, I recommend you looking around for <laughs> Hokuto Zankai Ken. <laughs> That's your favorite, your favorite if Hokuto you, attack. If you, if, I think it's yours too. No. And if you see that and like it, then there's this anime called Fist of the North Star that you'll actually like. But what I have for you tonight is a machinima of... Fist of the North Star, done in Gary's Mod, very, very well. <laughs> and I don't know what else I can say. For the record, my favorite Hokuto technique is the one where he makes you, you can't control your own body. And so then if you you're walk hol- backwards you're, into the lava. Or if you're holding a shotgun, you aim it at yourself. <laughs> well, that one wins because it's, it's not like mm-hmm. it just slowly aims at him. It's like, whoop, yeah. whoop. <laughs> I, that's, that's my favorite Hokuto technique. I like walk backwards over the cliff, same one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, my thing but of the Scott. Day, oh, no. Oh, no. That's, not, that's, that's my favorite Hokuto okay, and joke, <laughs> not my favorite technique. What works about this is that they ca- he kind of stretched the faces in Gary's mod to make them match the way those characters look. Yeah. And just the line, you're the smartest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a good plan. Anyway, so 
Uh, check this is a little web comic. It's just you know four comic strips in a row, all with the same theme. And the theme is caveman science fiction. And I lolled. So <laughs> it's I, pretty good. If I lull and Rim lolled, you will lull. Well, I like the fact you if pointed this out. If you're a Geek Nights listener and you don't lull, you suck. These, Get out of here. These cavemen and their conception of science fiction have envisioned a very small and yet surprisingly toroidally complex universe. Uh, I know. It's, it, that's, it, these are excellent comics. I mean, They're from DresdenKodak.com. So hooray for that guy and his webcomic. So in the meta moment, we'll be at MAGFEST! We'll be on the MAG9 talking about gaming in an intellectual context, also doing one of our own panels. Also, uh, Angry Video Game Nerd uh, James Rolfe is going to be there. Yeah, uh, we're going to hook up with him. Finally going to get to meet him because we're big fans. Yep. And uh, J- John St. John's going to be there. We already met him. We're yep. friends with him. Yep, he's a good... John St. John... Is actually a really funny guy in person. Magfest gonna be a lot of drunkenness, except on my part. Yeah, <laughs> rest of us will be drunk. I'm gonna be playing <laughs> games until I can't play games no more. We're also gonna be at PAX East, and my secret hint: soon we'll do a kind of PAX East pregame show because, as you all know, pa- well, bitch PAX, <laughs> PAX yeah. Boston 2011 is gonna be in the BCE seat, not the Heine. Different location. Everything's gonna be all crazy. The secret, the word on the street, the secret word is that there's going to be a much bigger tabletop presence, mm. among other changes. And uh, if you own Bananagrams, I suggest you bring it, because there's going to be a lot of fucking Bananagrams at PAX Prime yeah. and PAX East. But we'll be there doing two or three panels, and we got a bunch of other cons coming up. Blah, 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 blah. Much more important, if you want to give us money, the Geek Night store has been online for a while now, and you can buy the original Geek Nights t-shirt. Supplies are actually kind of running out. Is that the full supply on the floor there? That's the full supply. Wow. That's all we've got left. All right. I've well, got, we will order more once we sell out. I'm going to order more, yeah, as soon as we sell out. So if, like, ten more shirts get sold, we're going to order more of this Did one. we fix the international order issue? Uh, not quite. I'm working on a workaround for yeah. that. It's not because we don't want to or, we, you know, it's because the technology is not set up to do it. And I didn't, you know, I let Rim do it. And that's what you get when you let Rim well, do I it. Well, I didn't write anything. I used the Google automatic thing. Yeah. Um, the week after PAX East is actually Zenkai Con 5 in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there, too. We'll be doing stuff. Uh, that's pretty much it. The book club book coming up is Michio Kaku's Hyperspace. And we're going to be talking about World War Z probably, like, in two days. World War Z sucked ass. Anyway, I, fin- I finished reading it. We're going to do an episode on it, and, and we'll be done with it. I noticed how before you'd finished it, you were like, Rim, stop being so down on the book before we did the show. Now you're just well, being I mean, quiet. No, you can be down on the book. Just don't be publicly down on the book, because then people are going to, you know, accuse you of prejudice and all sorts of things. But you Scott- can avoid that if you had just waited until the actual episode to say it but sucks. But I had already it read the book. It would have been no problem. I had already read the book. The point is, Scott, you're supposed to not, you know... Did the book suck? Uh, n- I don't think it sucks as much as you say it sucks. Well, it, de- it, it, <laughs> it depends on your scale. On the scale of all books ever written, it's in, like, the top 10%. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is true. You know, because I, I have the, you know, the courtesy to hold back and not reveal until the actual episode. Ah, but I, being an open person who does not keep secrets... I'm not keeping to, a secret. ...and coming to you as the listeners and telling you exactly what I think. I'm divulging mm. information. I am much like a sage you're and You're ruining... A you're, de- you're decreasing the quality of our product, which is Geek Nights. So it's a decrease in quality to be truthful and No, honest. to be premature. Forthcoming? I'm sure the ladies would agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Rampart is... I'd say in my top three of arcade games ever made. I don't oh, know well, if I. I don't know if I'd say that. I really qualify that <laughs> versus arcade games. I don't even know if I'd say that. Name three that are better. Better than arcade versus arcade Direct games. Direct versus arcade games. I would games. rather play than Rampart. They have to actually exist and have to have been available in America. Oh, in America. Yeah, Jesus. Right. I'm not, uh, yeah, at uh, zero. Dance enough. Dance Revolution. All right, yeah. Uh, that's one. That's, that's higher. One. That's um, higher. Galaga isn't versus. Yeah. No. Um, versus. I mean, I could argue with Pong, depending if we were going to count based on, like, you know, my enjoyment versus overall quality versus influence versus historical value. Yeah, I'm saying value. my enjoyment, top three. You know, Pac-Man doesn't have a versus, really. A yeah. my, my enjoyment, top three? Yeah, because Rampart uh, really does it, doesn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Street Fighter, Super Street Fighter 4 wasn't released in the U.S., but I could pick, a- there, I could just pick any Street Fighter, and that could beat out Rampart. Yeah, that's two. Um, that's two. Uh, initial D, 
Yeah, Initial D is real good. D, but if not Initial D, there's plenty of racing games that are arcade machines I could put ahead. Uh, Soul Calibur was in the arcades in the United States. I could put that ahead of Ram I couldn't Hard. put... Well, I think part of my, my contention is that... A uh, virtual racing, definitely. There's a racing game I I'll put not, ahead of Rampart. I am Hard. by no means undefeated. The in point fact, is there's not a lot of arcade games that are versus that you're going to put ahead of Rampart. And when playing on the emulator... It's, short, it's on the short list. Top 10, easily. Playing on the emulator and playing, uh, you know, like on consoles and the way we play, I am by no means undefeated. I'm quite <laughs> often defeated. <laughs> but by crook and hook and luck, I am to this day undefeated on the arcade machine. Yeah, well, you know, I think the other thing is a lot of arcade machines, the trackballs are not well I think it's calibrated. purely just the fact that I'm really good with the trackball and most <laughs> people aren't. It's all, The sensitivity's on, it's flaky, you know, the, the mechanism is I find it is way flaky. less flaky than the fucking GameCube controller. Well, GameCube controller has its own problems, right? But I'm saying if the game was control with a mouse, scroll wheel to spin, click to place, click to shoot, it would be beautiful. So Rampart, it would be a work of art. Rampart is an ancient arcade game. It was ported to the NES and the SNES and all sorts of other places. If you've never played this game... You should just, play the actual music instead yeah, of just me doing that. Get No, not doing that. <laughs> Too much work. Get a copy of Rampart and play it against people. Single player game, whatever. The multiplayer is where it's at. Get it on MAME or whatever you can get it on. You play it's Tetris. also on Midway Arcade Classics Volume 1. Only get Volume 1. For the PS2 and or uh, GameCube. Because Volume 1, while it is just and MAME. And maybe the original Xbox, I don't know. It's just MAME and a bunch of ROMs, but it has both Rampart and Satan's Hollow. Also Sinistar. Sinistar. Oh, man, I hunger. I hunger. But Rampart, you play Tetris and surround castles, and then you, you place cannons, and you shoot the cannons to everyone else's castles, and then you have to resurround the castles. Yeah. And that is fucking it. Yeah, so he, to, to explain that in more detail, right, you've got a, you've got a section of a map, and all the different sections are surrounded by water. So these rivers, right? And you got three players maximum. And in your little area are castles. And you want to surround castles to stay alive. Good job, Orange Commander. Right. So you want to surround the castle completely. That means you got to completely enclose it so that the walls prevent anyone from walking into your castle, even diagonally, right? Every so round, you have to have a castle surrounded or you die. And that's right. it. You're done. So at least one castle has to be surrounded. And what you, you get these Tetris pieces that aren't the same exact shapes as Tetris pieces. They're all sorts of varying shapes. And the worst part you, is... You don't get to choose the shape. The shapes start out like single tile, double tile. Later, they're like eight tile random the monster. Pl the plus is the worst, right? I don't know, the plus, but also that U-shaped one in the and end the of the S, game. And the U-shaped one seems to always show up at a time when I can really use it nicely, but the S is a fucker. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's bad. It's not a Tetris S. Imagine, like, four Tetris S's. I just wish I could always get the three-stick, you know? Just always three-stick, and maybe the one piece when I really need See it. See, if, if we remade it, there should be some sort of draft for the pieces. No, because it take too long, right? But anyway, you get these pieces, and you have a time limit. So the number of pieces you can place depends on how quickly you move. Maybe you've got to get the pieces delivered via ship, and you shoot the guy's walls or shoot the ships delivering the good pieces. We'll see. Anyway, you place the pieces really quickly to surround the castles. And then after you've surrounded the castles, depending on how much area you've surrounded, because, I mean, you could just surround the castle and nothing else, but then you wouldn't have any area. You've also got to surround land you know, so that you have areas to put your cannons. Also getting points. More points means more cannons and right. means winning. So ideally, you would the ideal play would be to completely surround your entire area with one layer of walls, and the entire inner area would be just completely open. And that is never even come yeah, close not to happening. Happen. You, not, got like, you got like 20 fucking seconds. If you do that, you're fucking cheating, right? So, um, you know, and you get your first castle for free. It's not too bad. And so then you get to place cannons, and the more air you've got surrounded, the more cannons you get to place. But if you place too many cannons, it's hard to surround the cannons, you see, because you can't put pieces where the cannons you are. You also can't get rid of cannons. That's, and, oh, and you can if someone helps you out. No, they stay there they broken. They stay there broken. Because so. here's the deal with this game. So, all right, it sounds pretty simple. I shoot the other guy's walls, then we build. So... Smart people will shoot, like, one hole in the corner surrounded by other blocks so the dude literally needs a one piece or he cannot survive. Yep, and basically if he doesn't get a one piece, he's got to use all his pieces to surround some other castle because that first castle, it ain't going to happen this time. Many turn. times I'll have one awesome castle with, like, nine cannons in it that is just fucked. And I'm holding on to, like, another castle on the other side of my territory with, like, one baby cannon in there. Waiting for a one piece to save the previous castle. And, of course, every got one Every cannon, turn, the big swipe comes down.
down and wipes away a whole bunch of pieces. Every round that you have one cannon and Rim's playing, Rim's blowing up that cannon. That's right, because you can destroy someone else's cannon with ten bullets. So if you fire ten bullets, you can destroy someone else's cannon. If they only have one, now they can't shoot at you this turn. I cannot they express can, Maybe to you. they'll get one shot off because the shooting is real time. Maybe they'll get one or two shots off before you destroy their cannon. How crazy fun Rampart is in direct versus. Has this Rampart right, is the most fun. It has this right balance of multiple game modes, very quick gameplay, very high skill cap. Like, your skill matters a lot. A whole lot. And it's one of those games, kind of like a fighting game, where... You know, if I play against a random M. Bison online, I don't even get a hit in. Like, it's like, start, and I'm dead. That's the way a noob is against someone who's played Rampart in Rampart. Yeah, you're not going to surround your castle, and therefore you're not going to stay alive. The worst, the thing about Rampart is the way the game works, right, is if you die three times, you lose, because you get three continues. Well, no, it, that's just because we're playing the main ROM. I mean, you decide the rules. You can mess with that. You can say no continues, whatever. All right, but anyway, if you... If everyone dies in the same time, then whoever has the highest score actually wins. And if everyone survives to the final battle, then whoever has the highest score wins. But no matter how many continues you have, if you die, or how much higher score is, if you die on the final battle, that's it. So sometimes you got to go for it. You're like, all right, I'm going to die on purpose now to try to get more points by starting fresh and getting rid of all this BS. But... Maybe now I'll die for real because I run yeah, out of lives. Yeah, or like one, let's say one guy's doing so well. He's got all his castles surrounded. He's got a ton of cannons. And every single round, he's getting a zillion points. But if you find a way to just be alive for the final battle and then poke him in just the right spot to where he cannot survive on the final battle, even though he's got a bajillion points and you survive, you could win that. So, so you don't give up until the very end. So it's a game that has a very good mechanic of you're never out. You can always still win. If you're alive, with skill. if you're alive, and you surround you can, the you castle, can win. and you surround if you have at least one castle surrounded, you can win Rampart. Now, one reason we bring this game up, I mean, there's not that much else to say about it. The SNES, like that port of it, yeah. actually has a lot more going on. Yeah, in the, the only versions of Rampart I've ever seen are the SNES version, which is different, I think and an NES the one. arcade version, which is the same as the one that's in Midway Arcade Classics, because it's just a, a main ROM of the arcade version. The SNES so one, you can you can build a mega cannon that shoots way slow and takes a bunch of normal cannons up, but it leaves fire yeah. that you can't build stuff on. There's also a single player uh, Rampart where there's boats and soldiers attacking yeah, you. Yeah, the boats drop tanks, grunts. Yeah, but it's kind of bleh. I don't like it. Well, it would be fun. It, like My biggest complaint with Rampart is that it, for its time, it is unparalleled. Like It is an amazing game. And yet, to this day, no one has made that game again well. Yeah. It's one of those games, like, you know, we did this panel at PAX, Egregiously Unrealized Potential. And I, we didn't talk about Rampart. Rampart is one of the most painfully unrealized. Anyone could just take this game and make the same goddamn game. With no changes, just add network multiplayer and control it with the mouse, and it would be awesome. Just add or it, go add it, with no changes, no thought. You just clone it. Or go one step further and make it, like, crazy. Like, add stuff. Add, yeah, add some, you know, it'd be, that's, I'm saying it'd be awesome if you did nothing, but... Assuming you're going to do something, you can only make it more awesome, right? Here's some things that can make Rampart even more awesome, right? Uh, Co-op versus the computer mode. Co-op, te like teams Four versus teams. Four-player mode. Two-on-two two mode. Eight players. Uh, you know, varying numbers of continues, changing rule sets, th different stuff like that. Maybe a mode where you can place a cannon, but if you place a cannon outside your walls or in the water, it makes a boat that attacks the other guys instead of a cannon, right? You have options. Or maybe um, you've also got the armies, you know, the little grunts, yeah, and you're standing fast, after each other. You could choose cannons, be, make a fast cannon or a slow, powerful cannon that where the cannonball destroys four squares or destroys a cannon in two hits or, you know, stuff like that. You know, you can mix it up a little bit in there. I mean, or go one step further. Like, my crazy idea, I'll see, I don't think I have the resources to make this. You know, it, uh, Guns of Icarus, uh, Muse, they made that, Emily and Alex and all our friends. Mm -hmm. But it was the idea that it was a, a co-op FPS tower defense kind of game, you know, on an airship. Yep. What if Rampart was an NS style, you're running around in effectively Minecraft, building walls, and manning cannons. Well, that was an idea I had, right? What if you just took Minecraft, and the way it worked is there were cannons. And there were two sides in those water you couldn't cross between them. And the game, everyone had a castle that they had to defend. So basically it would be like, all right, the timer begins, go. And everyone has to build walls in Minecraft. So you have a whole team of people, tons of people building walls in between the enemy 
and your castle. And then it'd be like, all right, time's up. Now everyone fire cannons, and you aim, everyone plays an FPS where they stand still and shoot cannons at the enemy's walls trying to hit the enemy's castle. And then, time's up, build, rebuild walls, and you and of keep course, switching back and forth. There are nearly infinite variations on this theme, and all of them, it's kind of like when we were talking about... It'd be about, hard to make a version that was not good. It's kind of like when we were talking about Fallout 3 and how it was fun, but if they just removed all that combat BS and just made it a series of really interesting... You know, a bit, basically a graphical choose-your-own-adventure with a lot of stuff, we dismissed it like, yeah, that's just a big choose-your-own-adventure, dot, 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 and I would play the ever-living fuck out of a game like that. Yeah, if it was just the choose-your-own-adventure and didn't try to cloud it with, you know, stupid RPG leveling and combat. I play the crap out of old Rampart. A new Rampart? I would I would play that every yeah, day. Yeah, we still play old Rampart. It's sort of like Bomberman. You whip it out at the parties, and it's always a hit, you know? And the thing is, unlike Bomberman, where you have to worry about what version to play, you can't go wrong. There's only one version of Rampart. Well, there's the SNES one. But that's only two-player max. It's yeah. no good. You know, you can't get the four score in on that. It doesn't work. Yeah. But three-player works well, but it also has that kind of game theory problem that all three-player games have, which is Scott always claims that everyone just attacked him, and that's why he died. Which is true. Sometimes. Never. It's possible. <laughs> it is possible. And it happens. <laughs> Some, you know, I mean, usually what happens in Rampart is whoever looks like they're doing well is going to get ganged up on, right? If someone has a whole bunch of walls and a whole bunch of cannons, then the other two players are going to concentrate their fire on that guy first, and then maybe shoot each other a little bit. It's always funny to watch And like, then the guy, play. the guy who's doing really well is going to concentrate most of his fire on the guy who's doing second best, and then maybe fire some token shots at the guy who's doing third best. Because that, but every time we're playing, you'll see, like, right before the game starts, like, Scott and I both have our crosshairs over Scott Johnson. Yep. And then as soon as firing starts, suddenly my crosshairs go to Scott, who's going to me. Yep. Now, the, <laughs> so, thing, the thing is, right, is in Rampart, let's say someone is doing kind of shitty, but they're alive. You know, they, get the, they got, like, one cannon. If you ignore that guy who's in last place for even one round, you don't fire a single shot at him, uh, the next round, he's going to be insanely powerful. He's going to surround a second castle and fill it in with six cannons and have seven cannons. So just even even though a guy's in third place, you cannot afford to completely ignore him. you got to fire some bullets his way to force him to do some work every round. You know, Otherwise, you're asking for it. The game multiplayer-wise also has the good continuing mechanic of as you keep playing games, the scores continue to accrue. And whoever won the last round gets increasingly handicapped. Yeah, that's if you play m uh, multiple rounds of Rampire, right? So we play a round, and we go all the way to final battle, and Rim wins. Then we play another round. Rim only has three castles, and everyone else has four castles. It actually gives Rim a disadvantage because he won the prior rounds, you know? Um, I also, I'm not completely sure about this, but when you're on your second and third continues, your cannons look different. They're not different. Okay, they're not. So no. they, ju they just look different so that you can tell that that person is on their second or third continue. Yep. They don't actually fire faster or do anything like that. No, they're they not definitely any don't do more damage. However, I have fostered that false belief in other people in order to make them lose. <laughs> Well, how, would that, how would that make someone lose if they think their cannons are, are powered in up? In Katsukan, when we had all those Rampart games we were playing with everybody, yep. I, I, was a, I could have lost this game. Like It was kind of dicey. I convinced the guy next to me that he should attack the guy one next to him because that guy had the, quote, better cannons. Oh, interesting. It worked really well. Man, that Katsukan, they got a Rampart goddamn machine. And they put it in our video game room. We ran a Rampart tournament that was surprisingly well attended. Rampart is well known and well loved among good gamers. Mm. So, I don't know. Play Rampart. If you've never played it, play it. And I can't, there's almost nothing bad to say about this game. The only complaints I have are the that only, it's old. It's, yeah, it's basically, it's an old forgotten game and the controls are dated. It was designed to work with a trackball and a, and a, and a two button control system, right? But. The trackballs on the old arcade machines are difficult to use and very low sensitivity. And if you try to play any of the Midway Arcade Classics releases or a uh, MAME version, it's going to be really tricky to configure your mouse to work with the game properly. It's, you know, it's not going to be good. But if someone were to remake the game, the ideal controls would be mouse to move your crosshair when shooting and to click to fire your cannon when shooting. And when placing Tetris pieces, mouse to move the Tetris piece, scroll wheel to spin the Tetris piece, and mouse click to place the Tetris Here's piece. Here's one trouble with that. We would have to have way bigger maps or somehow make the game more difficult. Because imagining, I imagine playing right now without a mouse and keyboard, I would literally be, all the castles are surrounded. Yeah, it would be actually, 
improving that's part of the thing is improving the controls would actually make the game too easy. Kind of so like you if would, you play Halo with a keyboard and mouse that was legit. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So you there definitely needs to be in it thing is you can't not make that com control improvement right so i think you start by making the control improvement seeing how the game plays <laughs> right. and then tweaking the game maybe making it harder maybe increasing you know the size or the the resolution of the wall squares of course just know? making the game bigger would solve that because the maps are way tiny because of the limitations of the day yep but the thing is the tininess also makes it hard to put all the pieces in because you're so cramped and if you made it bigger, it might be too easy to get your pieces in because the crampedness would go away. Yeah, it's See, a, you got to play test. There needs to be a little rebalancing there if indeed the easier controls I think make the game too easy. Grunts would really fix it because grunts are basically just tanks that drive around. And if they touch a castle, they surround it and destroy it. And, you know, then you're just down one castle. But also, you can't place blocks on top of them. Mm -hmm. And they just, they like, wedge themselves in your wall. Now you're fucked. That could actually be something, right? If you could. Uh, you could have two different kind. You could have a kind of cannon that shoots over to the other side and is a cannonball, but the cannonball is stuck in the ground. So not only does it, you know, well that's what the flaming one does in the SNES. Exactly. So not only does it destroy There's a also, spot, it prevents you from building on that. In the spot. SNES, there are villages. If you surround a village, it turns into tanks that go attack the other guy. Uh. If you build over a village or blow a village up on your own side, it turns into tanks that fuck you. Mm. There's yeah. good. There's, there's all kinds of creative ways this game can be improved and modified and tricked out. And, you know, the, the fact that the base game is just so strong, it's like you can't fuck it up. Yeah, James Rolfe keeps saying, you know, we should, well, he said it once, we should remake Demons to Diamonds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good game, but remake Rampart. Rampart's not, way better. Not that much harder to remake. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, no, That's it. Just surround your castles and stay alive. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs> <laughs>